Good evening. I'm Chad Barber. I'm senior pastor here at EP. It's so good to be with you tonight. Uh, welcome to the Midnight Clear Cantata uh, tonight. I'm so excited. Um, one of my favorite lines in a hymn is in a hymn we're going to sing here in a few moments. It says, Jesus came to earth to taste our sadness. He whose glories knew no end, by his life he brings us gladness, our Redeemer, Shepherd, Friend. You know, tonight is a concert. You are going to hear some great music. Um, but this music that we sing, it points to a Redeemer. It points to our Savior. That's why we are coming together tonight to celebrate him. And so with that, let me open us with prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you are the one that came to clothe yourself with human flesh to taste our sadness, the one that had all glory and power and honor in the fact that you and what you did for us on the cross made a way for us to be glad, that we can have a relationship with someone that is multidimensional, our redeemer, our shepherd, our friend. What an incredible thing it is. And so, Lord, we pray that as we sing and as we listen and as we play, as we read, that you would be here with us, that um, you would usher us, usher us in your throne room, that we may behold your glory and in the process glorify you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In these days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Isaiah 60, 1 through 6, and verses 19. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and sent his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, and those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for, dark, for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory.
Isaiah 9, 2, and verses 6 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Of those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Micah 5, verses 2 and 4. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Luke 1, 26 to 35 and verse 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. 
And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Luke 2, 18 to 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the, of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Thank you. 
join us, VM 195, it's printed in the bulletin as well, so please stand and let's sing together, angels, you have heard of them. Verses 15 through 16. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in a manger. Thank you. 
2, 17 to 20. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. reading is going to be from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, 
and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just a few moments, I'd like to reflect on this last verse in verse 14. I was watching a a video of a news reporter recently going out on the streets of a city asking the question, what does Christmas mean to you? And I heard all kinds of all kinds of answers from the public. One guy said, well, you know, when I was younger, it was about the presents, but now it's about spending time with family. Uh, another man said, uh, for me, it's about getting time off of work and shopping. One grandparent said, it's all about the grandkids. And then another lady said, Christmas is about being with those that I'm not normally with, like my dad. You know, every one of those things that they mentioned resonated resonated with me on on one level, but, uh, you know, those things are more the result of Christmas. The meaning of Christmas is something else entirely, and it's what verse 14 is about here. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And let me just spend a few minutes explaining why this verse explains to us the true meaning of Christmas. It talks about the Word. Now, from verse 1, we see that the author is talking about the Word in a sense that we don't normally talk about with common words. He says, "...in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God." You know, the author is saying that the Word is God. Now, if you're new to church, if you're investigating Christianity, this might seem like a strange way of talking, but what this, what this communicates is two things about the nature of the God of the Bible. First, it's God's nature to communicate. His words are life-giving. It, his words are transforming because they reveal his character to us, and we've been designed to be in relationship with him. You know, one of the best decisions that Brooke and I made for our marriage was not owning a TV for the first three years of our marriage. Uh, Every time, every day we came home from work, what we did is we just talked. We listened and we talked. We talked about our days. We talked about our childhoods. We talked about our dreams, our likes. Uh, Through words, we pulled back the veil of who we were and revealed it to the other person. And the more that we communicated, the tighter we became. And by God calling himself the word, he's saying the same thing about himself. He is a God that wants to communicate with you. And if you listen to him through his scripture, and if you talk to him through prayer, you will uncover things about him that will amaze you. And you'll discover a lot of things also about yourself. The more that you talk to each other, the tighter you become. And the second thing that the verse says is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This shows us more of the heart of God. God is not only a God that loves to communicate, but this shows the incredible links he would go to communicate with you. It says the word dwelt among us. Now that word for dwelt in the Greek is the word for tabernacle. It literally means to spread out a tent, to take up residence. The probably the best translation of this verse is actually from Eugene Peterson. He says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. God came to earth to move into our neighborhood, to move into the neighborhood of our lives to communicate to us on our terms. And he didn't just come to talk to you twice a year on Easter or Christmas. 
He came to take up residence with you and be involved in the everyday life of your affairs. He gets life and he gets you. In Hebrews 4, 14, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the high priest that he's talking about there is Jesus. And when it says that he can sympathize with us, it really means it. I mean, when, it, it means that whatever struggle that you have, you know, whether it is with your career or with money problems or with your marriage or with your parenting, he can understand where you are coming from. He wants to listen, and no one else has better wisdom to know how to direct you in your everyday affairs. He wants to be involved. And if you knew what he had to offer, you'd want him, you'd want him to be involved in your life. So if you're new to the Christian faith, or if you're investigating Christianity and you want to get a taste of what I'm talking about, let me give you just a, a good first step to take. Spend one hour a week with God in church. There's 168 hours in a, in a full week. He's given you everything that you have. Every good thing comes from him. Could you just give him one week in church on Sunday morning? Let me close by explaining the last phrase of verse 14. It says, and, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the glory that he's talking about? Well, back in the Old Testament, um, God would show his glory in really magnificent ways. I mean, fire, smoke on the mountains, lightning, and it just uh, his voice would be booming. Uh, Moses is a man that, that uh, wanted to behold his glory. You know, Moses was a servant of God in the Old Testament. He talked with God. He listened with God. He knew the value of his relationship with God. And, and one day, you know, Moses thought, you know what? I want to take my relationship with God to the next level. God, I want you to show me your glory. Can you do that? God said, you know, Moses, I'm sorry, but... My glory is just so beautiful, so holy, so powerful. You won't be able to take it. It would kill you. But I'll tell you what I'll do. Moses, I'm going to give you an instruction manual. And it's going to tell you how to put together this thing called a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, I'm going to come. My presence is going to be there. And it's got built-in veils that's going to shield you from being killed when I come and be present with you. And for the longest time in the Old Testament, after they built that tabernacle, that's how they met with God. That's how he became present among them. So let's fast forward to the New Testament with Jesus. When John, here the author John, when he says that Jesus tabernacled among us, that he dwelt among us, we have seen his glory. It means that God somehow figured out a way for his glory to come down to us in a way that doesn't kill us when we're, with us when we're in his presence. So why was it that Moses would die if he beheld God's direct glory in the Old Testament? Well, it was because he was a sinner. And this is a bit of a long story for those, that you, uh, those of you who are new to the, to the whole Christian thing. But the bottom line is that we are all sinners. Moses was a sinner. We are all sinners. It means that at one point or another, we have all done things that offend God. We've hurt people. We try to live our lives apart from God. We try to rule our own lives when God really wants to have a relationship with us. And even when we try to do our best, sin is right there with us. And the sad news is that when we offend an infinite God, we can't be in his presence and survive. That's how it was in the Old Testament. That's why in the Old Testament, he would, Moses would have been killed if he was in, direct, in the direct presence of God. So again, God figured out a way to veil himself when he came. And the way that he veiled himself would be beyond the imagination of anybody in the New Testament. He would clothe himself with human flesh and his holiness 
was right there in their midst. And when he did that, when Jesus, when God the Son took on human flesh, he made himself vulnerable, he made himself killable. And that was all part of a plan of a baby born of a virgin who would grow up as a poor man, live a perfect life, and suffer a punishment that we deserve for all of our sins. So when it says that we've seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, what it means is that when we look at Jesus, when we behold Jesus through his scripture, in a manner of speaking, when we read scripture, we can behold him. We see a God that knows all truth, that knows us to the bottom. He knows everything that we've done, everything good, everything bad. He knows our strengths and weaknesses. But he also gives us grace. And what that means is that God would love us so much that he would take on, he would become vulnerable and killable to take on our sin and our punishment so that we could have a relationship with him through his grace. That's the true meaning of Christmas, friends. Matthew 2, 1 to 11. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And Matthew 1, 22-23. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for this child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went out on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them was there until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down, and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us.
join us again for the last hymn, which is straight from page nine. But we have good singing in the audience as well. I would like the last verse to be a cappella. To just voice is the last verse, last verse in the round. A cappella, we come back on the chorus. So last verse, a cappella, <laughs> we come back on the chorus. All right, let's stand and sing together. <laughs>
Let me close this in prayer. Dear Jesus, you are our heavenly Lord. You are the King. You are the one that made heaven and earth of naught and with your blood mankind you bought. Lord, we celebrate your birth and we thank you for all the things that we bought. It bought a way to communicate with you. It bought a relationship with you. And it bought the purchase of our lives and our souls. Lord, we glorify you. And all God's people said, Amen.